Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk with a highly prominent person who, whose achievements and uh, directions of activities are so much diverse that uh, I couldn't even believe how much to say and uh, just to grasp all the meanings of all the kind of activities and what, what we will do. So a uh, very warm welcome to Sir Fraser Stoddard, uh, 2016 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Dear Fraser, thank you very much for this opportunity to have a talk and to disclose some questions for you. Thank, thank you very you. much. My pleasure. Yes. So the first thing uh, to my mind, it's a very unique story. Like you were born in Scotland and you live on the farm. Uh, you, you may see so much experience, uh, different kind of things to do, but now you are in the USA. So this is like a really unique story, I think. But what influenced really your choice on the profession? Okay, well, let me go back to the farm. I spent uh, my first 25 years on a farm, um, only about uh, 12 miles, I guess, uh, 18 kilometers uh, south of the capital, Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a very interesting time in agriculture because we went from horses and carts to uh, tractors and trailers to combine harvesters and balers, all in quarter of a century. And what that taught me was um, that uh, you had to move with the times. Uh, both in terms of um, uh, embracing new technology and new instrumentation, new machines and so on. Yeah. And I, I look upon that um, 25 years on the farm as um, really um, the university of life um, because um, there was also a lot of animals and things like that. So it was a very <clears throat> broad education. But I think the thing that stood out for me was um, all this new machinery. And uh, I was really an enforced engineer to begin with. The question about ending up in America, well, there's quite a few things happened before that. I had three years in Canada. I had 27 years in total in two universities in England before moving to the United States in mm -hmm. uh, 1997. And the... Uh, driver for that was that uh, sadly my late wife contracted breast cancer in 1992. Mm -hmm. and we had just uh, moved our home from uh, Sheffield uh, to Birmingham, um, England's second largest city, uh, when I got um, a invitation from um, uh, Professor Hauk at UCLA to consider coming to um, take over from Donald Cram, who had been the 19... 87, or one of the 1987 Nobel laureates in chemistry. Okay. Uh, but I just had to write back and say, you know, we, we have so many problems uh, at a family level, I can't contemplate moving. Mm -hmm. uh, he extended the invitation, much to my surprise, again in 1994. Um, uh, we still were um, in a rather big pickle, shall I say, to use a phrase, with uh, my wife fighting cancer. Um, and then, uh, again, it was no, but um, in 1997, the <clears throat> sentiment had changed insofar as uh, my wife realized that she would uh, stand a good chance of getting better treatment for her condition if we moved to the United States. So. A lot of it was a family driver in the end. I had always wanted to go to the United States, but uh, my wife had not been so keen until you know, illness, uh, as it were, changed her mind. I understand. Well, now we know this reason. Okay. So... Uh, Let's talk about another thing, kind of, please. Uh, you know, I love the expression like not to have the life which is full of work, but to have the work which is full of life. And um, 
was it your aspiration to become a Nobel laureate or you just were doing your work? How do you think? It was never my <clears throat> aspiration to become a Nobel laureate. That was the last thing that was on my mind as a young person. Uh, it was just a question of uh, studying, uh, going through my apprenticeship, as I call it, at uh, Edinburgh University when I got my first two degrees and then um, going to Canada for three years uh, at the postdoctoral level. And all of that, um, you know, was 10 years of apprenticeship before um, I got an appointment at Sheffield University to the equivalent of an assistant professorship, namely a lectureship in chemistry. But uh, no, I mean, uh, I, I didn't dream or think about uh, Nobel Prizes. They were not on my radar. <clears throat> I understand. I think that just the, the efforts and the achievements are leading the person to this kind of awards and all the kind of uh, successful things that come in the life. Uh, well, uh, something about the heritage of life, uh, along with lots of awards and statuses and achievements in your life in general, uh, once you said that uh, the greatest asset and legacy in your life is that you have mentored more than 500 students over 50 countries. Uh, I think that uh, only a person who believes in his, let's say, reincarnation in, in mentorship influence on other people can think this way. So why you really came up with this idea? Well, um, I, I think it's probably ascribable to um, the fact that I happen to be born in Scotland and Scotland for centuries has been a very um, outward looking um, nation. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for Like Ireland, you know, another yeah. country where, um, you know, life um, for the ordinary citizens is not always uh, super easy. And um, the most countries and Scotland in particular uh, value education. And so I had a marvelous, thinking back, I didn't realize at the time, but I had an absolutely outstanding high school education and undergraduate uh, education at Edinburgh University. And uh, so I think that uh, set me on the trail to uh, uh, get uh, my appetite for seeing the rest of the world. So as I say, I jumped to Canada in 1967 and Mm -hmm. That was the first time I had boarded a jet plane uh, in my life and uh, at the age of 25. Um, so that was quite an adventure. And, you know, I remained there for the best part of three years. It gave me the opportunity to have frequent visits to the United States. And it was then that I started to realize where the leadership, in my opinion, was in science and technology. It was in the United States. And so... I started to hanker after um, you know, moving to the United States. But now if you go fast forward, I think the leadership in science and technology is on the move from the United States to China. And so um, you know, I'm contemplating if um, I leave the university here at Northwestern, um, a move to China, because um, I think that would be um, a very uh, fulfilling experience, um, how I will tackle the um, language for the first time, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I am uh, trying to train myself in uh, everyday Mandarin at the moment, in case I should uh, make that move. Oh, I see. But your kids, one, uh, one was in Japan, once you told, uh, somewhere, and in England. It's correct. Yeah, my, my elder daughter, um, so she uh, married an Australian. I should mention I've also got links, uh, strong links to the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, I have a um, professorship there in chemistry as well as here in Northwestern. Um, mm -hmm. But 
you know, my daughter married into a very well-known family, as it turns out, in Australia, the McCubbin family. So um, my uh, son-in-law, his uh, great-grandfather, I hope I get that right, uh, is quite, or was quite a famous uh, uh, painter uh, of portraits and uh, of um, landscapes and so on and so forth in the 1800s. Um, so I have this strong link uh, through um, my daughter to uh, Australia. And um, yes, they live in uh, Belmont, which is a suburb of Boston here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did spend, because my son-in-law is in the pharmaceutical industry, they did spend a couple of years in Kobe in, in Japan. And uh, of course, I visited them quite frequently while they were there. Uh, oh, I've, I've lots of good friends in Japan as well at the scientific level. <laughs> sure, Japan is also. Okay, I see. Thank you very much for sharing this. It's really interesting that uh, all this so story. I, and, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to comment about my other daughter, both daughters are PhD chemists for which I'm very proud. Um, the uh, <clears throat> situation for my younger daughter, Alison, is that uh, she is currently the founding editor of Nature Synthesis. Mm -hmm. uh, she was driven out of practical chemistry by having allergies that uh, was ascribed to uh, you know, chemical compounds when she was in a laboratory. And so she had to uh, leave that environment and go into publishing. And, there, she's been very successful. She took um, a journal called Nature Reviews Materials uh, to being the second most highly cited journal in the world I know. in a five year period and uh, has now stepped down from that job to take on another challenge. So there we are. And in total, I have four grandsons, three uh, with her and uh, one in Boston and one, only one granddaughter uh, living in Boston. Oh, great. And you see each other quite frequently? Yeah. Well, of course, the pandemic, just as it got in the way of your uh, movement, um, didn't make it easy. Uh, as it turned out, I was um, uh, in the UK and with my younger daughter yeah. when all the restrictions came in place. So I ended up spending uh, a whole year um, in uh, Cambridge, England with my younger daughter and her family uh, until March of this year when I moved back to the United States. Okay. And of course, during that time, uh, we could use uh, Zoom uh, to, um, you know, keep in contact uh, yeah, of course. with people and uh, in particular with a research group of 30 plus people. And, uh, you know, I learned that um, it can be made to work very well. Yeah, we'll hope for better. All right, uh, Fraser, some things about scientific publications. So our company is often faced uh, with the fact that age index of uh, most scientists is very poor, it's very low. And uh, we see that lots of people are really trying to make, uh, to publish scientific papers and make really lots of efforts. And some other people are like really lazy and uh, frankly speaking, they are publishing something like a garbage, let's say. So uh, you as a person who has age index like 157 based on Scopus and even more than 170 based on Google Scholar, uh, what can you advise scientists on how to manage and improve their positions and level in the, in the citations? Well, I mean, I've always, always aspired after doing the best um, science that I possibly could. And <clears throat> after a lot of training of myself, um, I was able um, to really get on top of the English language uh, and particularly in the writing uh, uh, side of it. And um, I have developed that skill as highly as I possibly could. It was as important as the science in order to be able to communicate through publications um, what uh, we had uh, 
achieved in the laboratory. Um, and to a lot, big extent, I felt that uh, I owed this to my students. Uh, you know, they had worked extremely hard in almost all cases. And uh, it was my job, uh, because many of them, English was not their first language. It was my job to help um, them find a route to um, publishing in, you know, what has become known as the high profile journals. And um, yeah. at the moment, um, you know, 70, 75% of my group are from China. And um, <clears throat> the uh, dynamic there in their country is um, that um, there's no messing around. You have to have a record of publications in high profile journals if you want to, uh, uh, um, you know, aspire to being uh, an academic yourself, if you want to get a job in a university of any stature in China, then uh, you will be judged on um, uh, your publication record, you know, whether you agree with this or not, it, uh, this is the, a fact of life. And so yeah, I understand. Uh, my present postdocs are, um, you know, not interested in <clears throat> publishing in uh, this low um, profile type of journal that you've referred to uh, in a sort of where you might be rubbish. Um, they're not interested in that. Um, they're only interested in uh, doing as good science as they're possibly uh, able to do. And then they're on my doorstep saying, do you think we can um, send this to um, nature or science or, you know, yeah. some of these big journals, yeah? Yeah, I understand. I think it's really better in life to practice the successful things and to, to choose high profile journals initially, because then when you got some low profile publications or some predatory journals, like, you know, uh, then the scientific profile of a person is quite um, not understandable at all. And just to publish for like, a, to make some, to sign some papers, like you need it for the establishment for institution, it's uh, not the right way. But unfortunately, in some as well Russian speaking countries, there is a uh, evidence and practice like someone just trying to publish nothing, just to make like a paper, you know, for for checking it on the work like that. Okay, but uh, how do you think the, the publication process when it was initially at the beginning of your career, was it easier or harder? And how do you see the change of this process like now and that days? I really don't see a very big change. It's remained um, under the peer review system that continues, uh, although it has uh, been changed a little bit. And uh, uh, But otherwise, um, you know, it was uh, quite tough to... Uh, put an article together, a manuscript, I should call it, um, and send it to a journal editor and uh, wait for weeks uh, while the reviewers pass comments. And uh, it's a fairly rough ride because um, a lot of the time you get surprises. You think this is a good piece of work and then uh, it is uh, torn apart by the reviewers, the referees, and uh, you have to, um, <clears throat> then take their advice and uh, if the editor is uh, in the uh, mode of wanting to um, <clears throat> read your uh, response and to your look at your uh, revised manuscript then you just have to work hard to um, lift the um, particular manuscript to the level that will convince the referees that uh, it could be accepted or they could um, recommend it, its acceptance. And that was the same for me in the 1970s as it is, is today. Uh, uh, we're still, um, and in fact, with the high profile journals, we have uh, very, very long reviewers' uh, comments and uh, it takes us maybe two weeks to plow through all of um, their comments, do mm -hmm. some extra experiments. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, ongoing activities at the moment in the laboratory uh, before we go back to the editor 
Um, and it's very important to do a very, very good job at that stage. I mean, you have to be um, very, very highly professional and answer all the questions uh, as best you can and uh, do the extra experiments that you're invited to do. And um, the chances are a good 90% chance that if you do that well, you will get your paper accepted. Yeah, it's um, the same dynamic as when I was um, 25 as it is now when I'm almost 80. It hasn't changed all that much. Okay, I understand. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got a little question about the gold. Uh, almost, you know, all, almost all gold mining companies worldwide use this toxic gold leaching process to sequester the precious metal by using cyanide. Uh, you have replaced harmful reagents with a cheap and biologically friendly components using the derived from the starch and uh, called it cyclodextrin. Uh, how did you come to this discovery? And uh, what was the reason to be engaged in such kind of activities for you? Can you share, please? Well, I always <clears throat> had uh, an interest, a strong interest in carbohydrate chemistry because that was the subject for my PhD. Uh, in uh, more detail, I studied the um, uh, structure of uh, plant gums for my PhD, believe it or not. Uh, these were are, are polysaccharides um, that are highly charged, so-called polyelectrolytes. Anyway, um, I decided in the 1970s that I wasn't going to um, remain a so-called carbohydrate chemist for my life. Uh, but there was one uh, form of carbohydrate uh, that um, I always had a great fascination for, and that is the cyclodextrins, of which there are three that are commercially available, um, alpha, beta, and gamma, with six, seven, and eight glucose residues, uh, respectively. Okay. So fast forward, in 2010, in a situation here at Northwestern where I've been able to give my research group uh, free, um, great freedom in, in, in what they do, uh, one of my um, postdoctoral um, researchers at that stage decided that uh, he would like to make a topological construct known as the Boramine rings. Mm -hmm. So you need to have three rings and the uh, requirement is uh, once you've put the three rings together, if you cut any one ring, the other two will fall apart. Um, that's the Boramia uh, topology. And uh, he chose um, gamma cyclodextrin, the one with eight sugar units, as his first ring. And he was trying to find out how you could feed uh, into this ring um, another ring. And so he was using um, uh, <clears throat> an organic compound, azobenzene dicarboxylate um, as its potassium salt. Okay. And he got crystal, and there were big cubic crystals, not only millimeters, but if you um, waited long enough, uh, they would be centimeter cubes, very beautiful. And uh, when the crystal structure was solved, this organic component that he was hoping would be the second ring was not to be seen. It was clearly um, removed from the scene, and it was the potassium that had linked together um, cyclodextrins in a cubic array. So six cyclodextrins were linked together to make a cube and then potassium linked these uh, small cubes um, ad infinitum into uh, these big crystals. And so um, we called this um, cyclodextrin metal organic framework okay. uh, because it was an extended structure. So that's where um, we were in uh, the early part of the last decade between 2010 and 2013. And this uh, technology incidentally went on to uh, become um, a skincare company, which is highly successful. Um, but uh, in 2013, again, under this sort of freewheeling 
situation where my postdocs and graduate students are left to come up with their own ideas. Um, <clears throat> another one from China decided one day, oh, well, let me just interject that I had been going around the world saying, as, what accompanies the potassium ion, which is positively charged at anions, and it could be any anion in, that we one could think of. It could be fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, acetate, trifluoroacetate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we would still get yeah. the seed off. And uh, the, this postdoc just turned things on its head because one day he used potassium tetrabromoate. So that's uh, an anion where you have gold in the middle and um, you have four bromines around it. And he gets a completely different type of crystal structure in a very short period of time. Um, it, pre it precipitates out this uh, material from uh, water in, in, in literally minutes. And if, if you um, okay. do it more slowly, you get this crystal, which are now needles. And these long channels contain uh, the um, <clears throat> potassium, of course, uh, present this time um, as a ion that is surrounded by six water molecules. Yeah. Okay. And the uh, tetrabromoate uh, are alternating throughout the middle of this um, whole stack of donuts. And so we have a new way of isolating gold suddenly. So serendipity in many ways is the reason, and it's because of double serendipity. Mm -hmm. First of all, in um, 2010, and then a repeat in 2013. And, you know, I can't emphasize how much uh, I think uh, serendipity plays a very important role in science. And in order for that to happen, you have to have an environment where um, there's a huge amount of freedom being given to uh, the experimentalist. <clears throat> wow. That's really great, I think, and really promising for future as well. I mean, if you want to know uh, very quickly about the present state of the company called Cyclodex. Sure, sure. yeah, please. It is uh, doing extremely well um, in mines in Arizona here in the United States. and. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, CEO is, uh, after the pandemic, uh, making great progress uh, in mines where uh, even cyanide would not work. And so they were closed down and uh, were really ready to be uh, approached, uh, these mine owners, by um, someone that had another technology. The last comment I'll make is that, in general, it has not been easy to uh, introduce this technology to the gold mining community. We found it to be very conservative. Um, I was told um, in mining um, places that I visited to uh, talk about the uh, new way of isolating gold to go away. They had used cyanide for over a century and they wouldn't be changing. Yeah, large but, companies are very hard to be convinced to make changes. Very, very hard to be convinced. But I think one uh, thing that is helping is that some years ago, the European uh, uh, Union uh, put out a directive that uh, any country in the uh, European community that was establishing a new mine for gold could not use cyanide and had to look for another approach yeah yeah that's good we'll hope that it will expand worldwide and we will have only biologically and ecologically friendly processes in this industry all right uh please can you say what can you now advise to the youngest luminaries of science in general <coughs> Well, first of all, you have got to be um, very curious about the world around you. Um, and you've got to have um, no end of passion about um, going forward with whatever science you uh, decide you're going to concentrate on. If it's chemistry, then uh, 
you, as I say, in my case, I had to undergo a decade as an apprentice, and uh, mm -hmm. then even after that, it took another 20 years as an uh, academic in two institutions in England, namely Sheffield and Birmingham, okay. to get us to the point where we made a big enough breakthrough uh, to pursue uh, uh, the um, <clears throat> making of the mechanical bond, which is uh, what I consider to be one of my biggest contributions to the chemical community. Uh, but that's just the beginning of a story because it then led to uh, molecular shuttles, molecular switches, and ultimately to molecular machines. Yeah. Um, so it's not an easy path and it's not in any way linear. It's not something that uh, you can say to people, um, you know, do this and it'll all work out for you. In my case, this has been uh, about 20 different uh, types of chemistry uh, during my uh, long period of over 50 years. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, it's always wise to dabble in more than one area at any one time. Um, and we still do that. Um, so molecular machines is only part of the uh, effort in my own research lab at the moment. We do many other things on top of that because it's driven, it's driven by the students. That's the important thing. Yeah. But to answer your question, it's all a matter of uh, just um, a burning desire to achieve within the subject and to be prepared to, if you want to single yourself out as making a unique contribution to the science, say chemistry, then um, you've got to take up something that um, has not uh, found a solution, that um, has the chance. If um, you work hard at it and you have a bit of luck to um, find that solution. Uh, and you've got to avoid jumping on to bandwagons that are very popular and uh, think that um, mm. it will make a major contribution that way. In that instance, the bandwagon was probably started by somebody else, and they will always get the credit for um, having started that area of uh, uh, chemistry or science. I see. All right. Thank you very much, Fraser. And also, can you share, please, three books that uh, which you may consider most influential in your life? Wow. Um, Just the first thing that you may recall, please share. Three books. Well, I guess maybe uh, I, I was. Uh, much influenced by Scottish authors when I was uh, studying English at school. So um, Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Treasure Island, I would say, was uh, oh, yeah, a fairly important book when I was, you know, very young. Yeah. And then um, The 39 Steps by uh, John Buchan, another Scottish author, mm -hmm. has, um, later on had, um, you know, some fascination and interest for me. Um, thereafter, um, that is less easy to uh, come up with at the moment. Um, you know, I read a lot, but uh, just singling out one that has uh, made a big impact um, is not so easy. Yes, you know, um, it's, it's well, you think just it's uh, very curious to to learn uh, different people like what kind of books really may influence on their life. That's why yeah, well, I well, like to uh, ask this kind of question. I've been I've been thinking uh, while you've been talking, and uh, the crop of books by uh, Gladwell um, have been quite influential to me. Um, yeah, uh, you know the ones I'm talking about, Malcolm Gladwell. I know the author, but uh, I I don't remember the uh, his stories. So um, it's, it's Gladwell. Okay. 
The third one is him. They put all of his books together, which most of which I've read. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I know well the Treasury Island, so it's really good book for young people to start and to read it. So, uh, dear Fraser, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I've got everything that I wish to learn uh, from myself, from our community, and we are really grateful for that. I want to wish you for the next 12 days the, that every next day would be the best days that you have in your life and the days would be even better. Well, you've been very kind, Alex, and uh, I wish you all the best with your family and your newly born, I think, uh, baby, um, and enjoy your family life and uh, do what um, you enjoy doing. I'm trying my best in enjoying family life and paying attention to them, not only into activities which we have in science. Good. So, good. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Fraser. Okay. Have a great day and a good day. And you too. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.